May the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here again, words written for you in Philippians chapter 2. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of My fellow redeemed, victorious Romans rode in great and extravagant war chariots. He rode on a donkey. The crowds gathered to see the spectacle when their heroes entered Rome. I don't know how large the crowd was, but the people kept following after, and as they praised Jesus as he went by, they ran to get back in line. So while all the city noticed, not all the city participated. The Romans adorned their triumph parade with conquered slaves, with exotic animals, and with piles of gold and silver for the people to look at and wonder. They waved palm branches and covered the road with their coats. The amphitheater roared with the sound of the crowds cheering their conquering rulers. They sang their hearts out. They gave the best that they could. But Jesus, he deserves so much better. Is this what the King of Glory the Lord of all, is this all that he could muster? And yet, this humble triumph reflects the work of our Savior perfectly. He didn't come to this earth for parades or for extravagant or extravagance or for accolades. He didn't come to have wealth and power and influence and glory that all the world would gather around to see. He came with a purpose. He came in humility. And so this is exactly the king he came to be. This is the exactly the king that we need. He was humble for his glory. It is the glory of the cross. It is the glory of his name forever. Paul was one of 13 people on the whole earth who were personally selected and trained by Jesus. He was the world's missionary who traveled the world. He wrote many of the books of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit chose him as his instrument and what did he get as a prize for all of this devotion? What glory was his for his labor? He was in prison, arrested, and nearly killed by his own people. His friends had deserted him. He, they were afraid to visit him there in Rome. He was alone. He was isolated. I don't think we can say that the Philippians' life got better after they started following Jesus. They still had all of the same cares and troubles and burdens and hardships that come into every life as they did before, but now they were separated from the rest of society. Now they had to deal with the threat of persecution. If Paul 
Even the Lord's servant Paul could be arrested. What would happen to them? Weren't they God's children? What did they get for their devotion? Perhaps these thoughts and doubts cross our mind from time to time. We are in a time of suffering, of sickness, of death, of loneliness and isolation. Where is God in all of this? Where are his promises? Where is his comfort? Where is the glory, the power that belongs to him? What do we get for following Jesus? What do we get for all of our devotion? Well, Paul answered that question to the Philippians, and he answers it for us as well. Joy. Paul said, I will rejoice. Paul rejoiced in his chains. He rejoiced in his suffering. He rejoiced in the privilege of being a carrier of that gospel of Christ. He rejoiced in the Philippians and their faith and their love and their support. He rejoiced in his prayers. He rejoiced for their prayers. He rejoiced at all times and in all places, as he would later write, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it, rejoice. And the source of this joy and his encouragement to them and to us to share that joy comes from this. Your attitude should be, indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we want to share the Christian life, if we want to have the Christian joy, then our attitude must be like that of Christ. For the world and all of its power, all of its wealth, all of its influence, all of its riches and comforts, they are not the source of our life. They are not the source of our comfort. They are not the example we follow. We, dear Christians, follow and what exactly was Jesus' attitude? Though he was by nature God, though he was God, all-powerful, all-mighty, all-knowing, ever-present, all-wisdom, perfectly holy, perfectly just, unchangeable, and eternal, though he was God. He did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, to be held up, and to be held over everyone else. But he emptied himself by taking on the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness, and his appearance was like that of any other man. Jesus did not hold on to his glory power and his might. The all-powerful, immortal, unchanging God took heat and suffering and mortal flesh to himself. The flesh did not become a God, but God, the fullness of God, took flesh to himself. And he did not do this for his own glory. He did not do this to display that glory so that everyone would stand in awe of him. No, he took the very form of a servant. He never used his power and his glory for his own gain, but he emptied himself. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. A good leader won't ask the people under him to do anything that he himself would not do. And about right now, this is being put to the test in many businesses around our nation. As the government
government has ordered their non-essential workers to stay home and they try to keep their businesses open somehow. Without the low man in the pecking order to take out the trash, to clean the bathrooms, or to scrape that strange goo off of the floor in the back room, they must. But they can take this comfort. It's still their business. It's still their choice. They decide what needs to be done, and they decide what gets to be wait. That gets to wait. They get to decide how far they will go. He spoke, and it was. He prophesied, and it came to be. He promised his people, and they believed. They tried to follow the law, his law, as best they could. They trusted his promises, and he guided and guarded all of history. But now he takes on flesh. Now the God over all rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now he is worshipped and praised by palm branches and by people laying their tattered cloaks in the road. Now he humbles himself. And just how far is he willing to go? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He becomes obedient under the law, the law that he himself spoke. He who commands the entire universe becomes a slave to the elements. Sinful men rule over the king of all things. And he is arrested. And he submits. And how far is he willing to go? To death. Death on the cross. Throughout Holy Week we see this humble attitude in our Savior. He rides a donkey and defends those people who praise his name. He spends his last week in the temple courts um, refuting the false teachers and then also proclaiming the truth and teaching the people about his hope and his love and his peace and his joy. On his last day, he washes his feet and he serves a meal for their eternal life. He prays in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. He is arrested and bound. He is blasphemed and beaten. He is flogged and he is condemned to death. The cross to which he would be nailed makes him stumble. And though he could have ended the agony, and silence all those who are mocking him, there he remained. He was obedient all the way up to death, even death on the cross. And so our Lord, our comfort, is not measured in our wealth or our comfort or the things that we have, or our influence, or our power, or even how we are feeling on the inside right now. No, God's love and our comfort has already been proven to us. It is proven in this King who rides into Jerusalem to die. Proven in the God over all who humbles himself and becomes obedient to the law because we are not who suffers sin and loneliness so that we never suffer sin and loneliness alone ever again. He becomes obedient to death to conquer death forever. This is Jesus' glory. 
It is the glory of the cross. It is the glory of salvation. The glory of a God who loves his people so much that he would give up all things. His very life to save them. This is the glory of our humble and so as we approach this Holy Week, may that attitude be within us as well. As, up, as we have received all things from the Lord, and we have received His glory, His forgiveness, His eternal life, may we live with that humble attitude that lives to serve. Not just lives to serve our God with the praises that we bring, but lives to serve Him by serving our neighbor. May we rejoice to share in Christ's suffering. May we find comfort in the cross that the Lord places on our backs, because when we are under the cross, then we are under the glory of Christ. Now, is it worth it? We are willing to suffer many things as long as we think it's going to be worth it in the end. Is it worth it? Jesus suffered all of these things, but then look at what he got as a payoff. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord the glory of God the Father, exalted, and every knee, not just Paul's knees, not just the Philippians, or believers, or our knees, but every knee will bow to him. His name will be above every name, and he will be confessed by every tongue. His name will be on all lips as they see that he is Lord, that this king who suffered and died is God over all. Bend the knee. That is a symbol of respect. Bend the knee. It is a sign of a person's fidelity, their faithfulness, their fealty to their Lord. Bend the knee. It is a sign of submission. When all fight has gone out, when all resistance is over, bend the knee. That is the demand of the monarch over his or her subjects. If submission was Jesus' goal, if he just wanted everyone to acknowledge his greatness and his power and his might, well then he would not have needed to humble himself, and his death would have been completely unnecessary. He has more than enough power to make all knees bend before him. He spoke from Sinai, and the people's knees bent in trembling. He would appear and people would shake in fear. He could demand that every tongue acknowledge him. For the demons know that there is one God. The demons proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, and they tremble. All people upon their death will stand before the Lord, and their knees will bend. On the last day, Every knee will bend before him, and so many eyes will be filled with terror, with sadness and sorrow, and with hatred. But their knees will bend. Sometimes that's the kind of God we want. We like that God who speaks from Sinai and gets everyone to obey him. We want that God who gets things done, who gets noticed. It is good to have a God who gets all those people to act 
the way that they're supposed to act. And when our sinful hearts desire this kind of God, it's amazing how often the way we want others to act is the way we think they should act. That is until that stare of the law, God's judgmental stare turns back upon us. When we fall under his judgment, when that law speaks against our hearts, then all of a sudden our necks get stiff and our knees no longer want to bend. You see, if the Lord had entered Jerusalem in a war chariot, the people would have shaken with fear and they would still be terrified. Every heart that refuses to repent, every heart, every knee that stiffens against the Lord, every heart that rejected the Savior riding on a donkey, their knees will bend in terror on the last day. But that was not Jesus' goal. No, we are told that God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. And what is that name? It is the name that is eternally his as God. It is the name that God revealed to his people. Yahweh, the great I Am. The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in love and mercy. This is the name of Jesus. He is the God who saves. He is the name of the God who has mercy. He is God's love and his promises in action. And all people, every tongue, will bow in awe before God's grace and mercy as they see what the Lord has done in Christ Jesus. Every tongue will confess that he is the Lord the God, the God who keeps his word, who keeps his promises. And we, who trust in him, who live in him, who believe in his name, we have reason to rejoice. For in this name, Jesus, we are forgiven. In this name, Jesus, we have life. In this name, Jesus, we are saved. In this name, Jesus, we do have glory, no matter what it looks like out there in the world. In this name, Jesus, we confess now, and we will confess that name of God's love and his grace forever. Truly, we feel a little humbled right now. We couldn't even have our little procession this morning. But no matter how we feel, no matter what anxiety rises in our hearts, no matter what trouble comes our way, we have the same work of Christ. He humbled himself as our king for our salvation. He bore the cross to save us from our sins. And so also may we find comfort in his name. May we rejoice to serve him, to suffer for his name, to carry our crosses with humility, to help each other and our neighbors with his abounding love. It is this name which we praise, this name which is glorified in all the earth, this name by which we will live forever. Amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Kate's